Oui. Wow. Um, um, the, the guy who followed Wade had a hard act to follow. Um, what a hard set of acts to follow. Um, it was interesting that we're put together because, among other things, we have something to do with technology or science. Um, a thing that Moses didn't say is that with Nico, um, all of us are better or worse musicians. I think I'm the worst musician of um, those, those of us who are speaking today um, in this session. Um, and um, we're also all Americans, um, which, um, and I, I could give a much less articulate version of the talk that was just given. Um, I think as a scientist um, who does a lot of public speaking, um, some people come to hear us because they want to be wowed about science. And I have done that talk many times with different subjects of the research that I've done. I work on the question of what is space, what is time, um, what is the history of the universe, where did it come from, what is matter, how do things move, how do we understand how things move. Um, Nico said that the key question that makes people artists and musicians that they respond to is what is our place in the world? And what at least some of us scientists are driven by, and I think myself, is the same question. And maybe I have a peculiar kind of mind, and maybe Jaron could explain it, and somehow maybe I got lost somewhere between language and cuttlefish or something. <laughs> but my need to understand what my place in the world is somehow had to go all the way out and wonder, well, what is place? And with place, you have to know what is space, and what does it mean for something to be somewhere? Okay. And that's where I had to start to get to what is our place or my place in the world. And what I'd like to do with this talk is tell a story which is a little bit about science and is a lot actually, the part that's about science is all about what does it mean, what is place? What does it mean where something is? Okay. Um, and the talk is also a lot about politics <coughs> and in a peculiar way is motivated by trying to have something constructive to offer for the crisis that John Barrow just talked about. Um, and that is, what is democracy? Which I think is a problem that we are, many of us are thinking about and should be thinking about now. Um, now, the moral of my talk is that to think about what is democracy you have to think about not just what is our place in the universe, but what is place and what is space. Now, um, I'll go some, I've been very inspired by the previous talk, so I won't follow all my talk, but I'll start with a story, um, which was gonna be the start of my talk, and then go into it a little bit. Um, so I've been a scientist for my adult life, um, I wanted to be a musician, but I, I wasn't in the league of other people. Um, and um, about three years ago, four, three and a half years ago, I had this wonderful experience where somebody came to me and said, we would like to make a scientific institute in your field. Okay. We can't tell you where it is. We have more than $100 million. We can't tell you where it's from. Okay what would you do and how would you do it? How would you start afresh and organize, bring together a group of people to do science who think about what is space, what is time, what is quantum, the history of the world, and so forth. And so with this unknown person whose name was Howard Burton, who actually one could look him up, of course, on the internet, he came from Toronto, what's, where's Toronto, what's going, I was in England at the time. Um, and. Um, and eventually, this conversation developed um, into a visit here to meet Mike Lazaridis, who turned out was the person with the vision behind it. And part of Mike's vision, which has to do with his vision of the future of Canada, 
um, which he could articulate better than me, is about supporting pure science in this, for the same reasons that one supports arts, as well as because that's really the way that um, technology is born, not by supporting technology, but by supporting the pure science. Um, and Mike put one, one restriction on how we thought about it, which is whatever you do, it has to be democratic. You have to bring together a group of scientists without the hierarchy and the structures of the ordinary academic world. After all, he could have given the huge pile of money to a university and they would have done what universities do. So um, three years later, here it is, um, here we are. Um, this was our Christmas picture from the Perimeter Institute. Um, this is the scientific staff. And, um, and we have had an absolutely wonderful, I've never had so much fun, so much exhilaration, so much challenge in bringing together a group of people to do science. And here is, I hope this works, here is some of the questions. And I'm sorry, I'm an academic. So there are words there and there are words here and I can't flash my chromatophores. Okay, <laughs> but you don't have to read them if you don't want to. We started out by really saying, okay, you know, what in the world are we scientists with souls of artists and musicians and so forth doing in the academy, in the universities? After all, the universities were organized in the medieval period to preserve old knowledge. They were, preser they were meant to make sure that nobody changed anything in the texts. And science is about novelty and discovering new knowledge. Why are we in the universities and are these hierarchical governance structures that the universities work with, are they the right way to do science, especially since in the science, the kind of science that I do, theoretical physics, okay, most of the good ideas come from people in the first years of their career. And the only way that you can stay alive, and something that somebody my age worries about a lot, is how to stay, have as much fun as I did 10 years ago, okay, is by switching and going into new unknown areas where you have no authority. Like, for example, standing in front of a group of people talking about politics, which is where I'll get to, talking about democracy. Um, how do we do this? Um, and we see what we're doing as an experiment and as a mirror of the way in which science itself is an experiment which is part of human culture to try both to understand things and also, as I want to explain, as a, we are a kind of experiment for the whole project of democracy. Now, Thinking about how to organize ourselves as scientists with no ground rules, just a lot of resources, led us to go to the back and ask, okay, how does science work? What is science and how does it work and why is it worth doing? Okay. Now, there one runs into a funny thing, which is that there's, of course, an official literature about what science is and why it works, published by official philosophers who have titles about being philosophers of science. And I knew something about that because of a little bit of a misspent youth. And, um, and here is 20th century philosophy of science in one minute, um, the, which is the following, which started out with people saying, there must be a scientific method. There must be a method to what those people do. Um, and by the way, Wade, I really think what we do is the same thing as your shamans back there with the plants or out there, but that's a discussion we could have. Um, what, um, but the philosophers said we follow a method and that method consists of being able to verify the meaning of every word in your sentences. Well, that was obviously wrong, although it got some people PhDs and professorships. Then there was the next idea um, of Karl Popper, who was a Viennese um, intellectual, went to England and impressed them all. They were way too vulnerable in those days in England to Viennese intellectuals. And um, he said, no, it's not verification. It's being able to falsify. It's being able to prove your theories wrong that makes something scientific. And he was also in the 30s and 40s very, it was very important to him to differentiate science from activities like Marxism, of which he disapproved, that were claiming to be scientific. So he said, it's all about falsification. Well, that's an important moral. It's an important ethic. but. You don't have to be in the scientific community very long to realize that that's really got very little to do with it. So, um, 
then Feyerabend came around, also a Viennese intellectual, who started off as an actor, um, and said, no, there really isn't a method. Okay. And that kind of whole thing kind of burned down, sort of like AI, like, you know, since the 80s, um, what happened? Um, so, um, because nobody was able to invent an uh, idea about what the scientific method was that we scientists could recognize as having anything to do with what we do on a daily basis. So here's how I think science works. I think science works because scientists are composed of communities, and each community is tied together by ethics. There's no rules, there's no method, but there's a sense of ethics. You should tell the truth to your colleagues. You should fight as hard as you can. You see, the ethics of the scientific community is a balance between rebellion and respect. And this is the thing that makes it work. If you're going to be a good scientist, you've got to be rebellious. You've got to fight. You've got to believe that the people older than you, your teachers, are, are, you've got to rebel. You've got to think they couldn't possibly be doing it right. You can do it better. Otherwise, why bother? You've got to believe in your ideas and your intuitions. But at the same time, you're not alone. And you, what you also believe is that you're part of a community and a tradition that has in it crafts which help people to find error. Because you see, we human beings, we're very good at drawing conclusions from incomplete information. That's what we're really good at. Okay? And that means that we fool ourselves all the time. And what science consists of, these communities, they carry with them crafts which when you learn, you get good at detecting error. And you learn to detect error in your own work and in other people's work. And that's, I think, all science is. It's a bunch of communities. In each one, you learn a craft that makes you part of the community when you're good at finding error. And then you become part of a discourse in which you're trying to find truth about something. Okay. Now, why one reason I think science is relevant for democracy is that the values and the ethics of the scientific community recognize that there's disagreement, recognize that there's pluralism, recognize that no matter what your point of view is, you have a commitment to reach agreement based on things you can talk about and argue about with the other people in your community. And I think that this is a model for how democracy works. The difference between a democracy that works and one that doesn't is that people, enough people in the one that works have a sense of good faith that without violence, without fraud, we can come to some decisions and go forward. And I think one model for that, and maybe the most powerful model, is the scientific community. Okay. Now, not only that, okay, the scientific community is very, at this point, pluralistic and international. And we at Perimeter come from all over the world. Very few of us are Canadians. And we are also an experiment in something that Pico Iyer um, talked about, which is this growing nomadic community from all over the world who are learning to work together and form a kind of society, which Pico last year here called the Society of Global Souls. Now, the thing that I'll, however, go on to, and what I want to, the, the one thing that I really want to explain here and present to you is a possibility that maybe science is important for democracy, not just because of the things I've been saying, which after all are sort of just sociology, okay, but because to think about what a society is, to think about what your place is, we don't have many templates. And the template over and over has been, for thinking about our place in society, has been thinking about our place in the universe. So what I want to present is, in three minutes now, a 1,000 years of intellectual history. I did 100 years in one year. Okay? <laughs> a 1,000 years of intellectual history of how people thought about what is their place in the universe. And you'll see that there's a parallel to how we think about what is our place in society and how does society work. And the moral of this is that maybe the crisis that democracy is in now can be illuminated by, if we ask what's the next steps in democracy, what's the, what do we go from here, maybe we should ask 
What are the people who think about what does it mean to have a place in the universe? What are they thinking about? Okay. So here's the first of three stages. This was the universe of Aristotle and Ptolemy okay, from more than 2,000 years ago. They saw the universe in the following terms. There was a hierarchy, that's the key word, okay, from lower to upper. At the bottom was the earth, that was the lowest level. Okay. And that was where change was, because they didn't know anything about evolution or self-organization. They equated change with decay and that with the human condition, and that took place in the lowest sphere on earth. Then around the earth were a set of concentric spheres which were made of a different essence and followed different laws than did the stuff on the earth. And that's where the planets and the sun and the moon were on these spheres, rotating. And then there was an upper sphere on which were affixed the stars, and outside of that was God and the heaven and the angels and so forth. In the Christian era, it was God and the angels. In the, for the Greeks, for example, Plato was the prime mover who had to turn a handle to keep the whole thing moving, okay? coming from above. Okay. Now, of course, that um, way of thinking about place apply to their society. They thought about their place in society in the same way, in terms of a hierarchy from lower to upper, from God and the angels up here, then the kings, the pope, the bishops, and so forth, on down to the common people. And, the, and just like earthly things and heavenly things satisfy different laws of physics, okay, ordinary people and kings were subject to different kinds of laws. Okay. Now, that was overthrown in a process that lasted from Copernicus's book in 1540 to Newton's book in 1687. And that universe, I'll call the Newtonian, and you'll see I'll also call it the liberal universe, is very different. There's no more hierarchy, and there's no more distinct laws for different realms. There is one law, and it applies equally to all, but there is a new element which is called space, absolute space. And the property of anything in the world, the particle or anything like that, has its properties like its place, its position, its motion, with respect to that absolute space. But all that the universe is filled with is an equal set of particles which all get their properties and their laws from space. Space is absolute and eternal. Okay. That was Newton's construction. Now, John Locke is a political philosopher credited with the invention of liberal democracy, and many other people of that time studied Newton, read him. They also knew him. John Locke and Newton were friends. And they invented a society in which there was one law that applied to all, in which individuals were like atoms. They got their rights, the notions of justice, with respect to some absolute unchanging background of what was the rights, what was a notion of justice, not with respect to each other. Their notion of society was the same, whether there was one person in it or a billion people in it, just like the Newtonian physics would apply the same to a universe with one atom in it or trillions of atoms in it. And that was the Newtonian universe. Everything, there's no more hierarchy, but everything depends for its definition, its rights, its properties, on its relation to some unchanging absolute. Now, that was overthrown in the beginning of the 20th century with relativity and quantum mechanics. And relativity and quantum mechanics are based on a different vision. And I'll end by telling you what this different vision is, because it is the intellectual universe that we scientists live in now. And I believe that it is the intellectual framework which maybe people thinking about democracy can take advantage of. And that is, there is no longer your sense of place is not in relation to something absolute and eternal. The only thing that the world is, is a network of relationships. And that network of relationships evolves in time. So there's nothing static, nothing unchanging, nothing absolute. Anything is defined only through its networks of relations to everything else. Now that is our vision of physics. Okay? That is the idea behind relativity theory, in a certain sense behind quantum theory, the whole, all the scientific work I've been involved with, the quantum theory of gravity, has to do with instantiating that vision. And we have completely instantiated that vision. We live in a world which consists of nothing but networks of relations which evolve. Okay. Now, I'm just coming on to the 
And okay, I'm not a politician, I'm not a social theorist, I'm not even a musician. Um, but when I talk to people who do think about those things, okay, I detect that they are asking the same questions that we are, how to define Nico's question, how to define one sense of place, and how do we radically change how we think about our place with respect to society and with respect to the history of our society. And I suspect that social thinkers will come to think about society as an evolving network of relations. Okay. And I hope that such a view, because it's pluralistic, because it's truly democratic in the 20th century sense rather than the 18th century sense, will, will give us a way out of the dilemmas and crises that we have. So thank you very much.